Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where a homophobe has a really, really close encounter with a gay person. Our next Reddit post is from FoxDVD. This took place in the late 70s in a much different time. My father was an ex-military, macho, 6 foot 4 police officer in California when I was a kid. He was also a sexist homophobe who would yell at the TV about gender bender movies and gays taking over the world. I cannot stress to you enough how much he hated gay people. My dad had to have emergency surgery on his gallbladder. At the time, this was a much more involved process than it is today. The rest of the story was told to me by my mom because I had to wait outside with my grandma when this happened. They had to put a catheter in my dad right before the process, and my father was uncomfortable having a female nurse do it, so he requested a male nurse. A few moments later, the most flamboyant gay nurse bursts into the room and in a loud voice announces, So, you want a male nurse, do you? Well, I can fix you up. My mom said the look on my father's face was pure horror, but he was in utter shock and allowed the nurse to put in the tube. He never spoke of it, but my mom would laugh about it even years later. On a side note, my oldest daughter came out as gay, but as you can imagine, she did not want me to tell her grandpa for years. It finally got to the point that my father was making my daughter uncomfortable, so I had to tell my father that he was basically out of my life forever. He came by in tears and apologized to her for all the negative things that he said over the years. He completely changed who he was after, and now he's part of my life again. He continues to make an effort to be a better person even to this day. It's sad that it took losing his family to change him, but change he did, and for the better. Also, OP adds, I just wanted to clear up one small thing. My father's reluctance to have a female nurse work on him wasn't because he was shy. He was in fact very open and proud, and in no way shy in that area. He honestly believed that a female nurse would mess it up, and he felt more comfortable with a man doing it. It's funny, because my youngest child is in her final year of medical school, and she's going to be a surgeon. Growing up, my daughter was always smart, and my father would encourage her to someday be a nurse, and she would argue with him that she wanted to be a doctor. It was only when she scored one point off a perfect ACT test that he finally seemed to realize what he was dealing with. Our next Reddit post is from Beehide Reborn. About five years ago, I was working as a production supervisor for a metal forging company. We had recently acquired a contract to make a transmission part for a well-known American motorcycle brand. The transmission part was being made on a hydraulic press, and we had trouble with the manufacturing due to the part's unique shape and the fact that this part should have been made on a forging hammer press, not a hydraulic one. We were getting very behind on customer orders due to the fact that we typically had to either repair or replace dies approximately every 1,500 pieces. This is in contrast to other parts that had die lives exceeding 6,000 pieces. My manager, who had only been on the job for about six months, pulled me into the office and told me that on the next run, do not shut down for any reason unless the forge press breaks down. I tried to clarify that our dies wouldn't last and I would have to stop the process occasionally to replace the dies. He was emphatic that under no circumstances was I to shut down the process. He even went so far as to email me a reminder of this. Hopefully you can see where this is going. During our next production run, we don't stop, even though my quality control guy is losing his mind over how bad these parts are. I tell him don't worry, this is all on me and my boss, because he doesn't know about my manager's demands. We set a production record, even though maybe 1,000 out of the 4,000 pieces we made were actually usable. The next day, the plant manager and quality director pulled me into the office. They explained to me that I'm probably going to lose my job due to the fact that I blatantly allowed non-conforming parts to be produced. I asked if I could print an email for my defense. They give me quizzical looks, but the plant manager says okay. I print off the email for my manager stating not to shut down for any reason, and I hand it over to my bosses. My manager got reamed! And I got a firm reminder that, regardless of demand, we must assure quality over quantity. And the only reason why I wasn't terminated was the fact that I was acting under explicit direction from a manager. Down in the comments, we had this contribution from Bro Lilliput. Pro tip, if you ever get this, you should have known to ignore a direct order garbage from senior leadership. Then you need to ask the following clarifying question. 
just to be sure I understand, you're saying that I have decision-making authority and I can override my manager's directives in this matter? And get it in writing. Presto, you've been de facto promoted to management. Our next Reddit post is from Tobob. A long, long time ago in the late 90s when I was a young IT consultant, I was sent out of state on an assignment. The sales manager decided to make all the travel arrangements for me and my coworker. We were to stay at a Holiday Inn type hotel that he booked for us. When I asked about daily expenses and a rental car, the sales manager told me the hotel had a shuttle that would take us to the work site and we could eat at the hotel restaurant. I tried to argue with him that I'd like to see the town or eat somewhere other than a hotel room, but he wouldn't budge. He paid for the flights and the rooms, and we could charge our meals to our room. Anything else would be paid for out of our own pockets. I was young and broke, so I didn't have much of a choice. I settled into the expectation that I would have a boring week of hotel, work, hotel, work for five days. When my coworker and I arrived at the hotel, we were quite surprised to find that this was nothing like a Holiday Inn, despite the fact that it had the word Inn in the name. It was quite fancy, and the rooms were comfortable and spacious. The hotel restaurant, though, was something that my lower middle class self had never experienced. This was a type of restaurant that didn't print prices on the menu. In fact, I couldn't even pronounce half the items listed. Meals were a set cost regardless of what you ordered. Breakfast was $40 per person. Lunches and dinners were $60 per person. Knowing that we had no car and no way to expense anything that wasn't charged to the room, my coworker and I dutifully ate three meals a day at this hotel restaurant. I had five days of filet mignon for breakfast and various gourmet lunches and dinners, while the hotel shuttle took us to and from the workplace all week. Now, years later, I'm not even sure if I remember the city that I was in or the work that I was doing. But I do remember a week of filet mignon for breakfast and the look in the eyes of the sales manager when he saw his credit card statement. That was a great trip. Our next Reddit post is from R. Dunking. My new wife and I recently took a trip to Denver on a United flight. I fly often, but not as often as some other people. When I booked the flight, the plane was fairly empty, so I booked the window and aisle seats in premium economy section right behind first class seats, leaving the middle seats empty. By the time we actually flew, the flight was nearly full, so I checked the seat chart and noticed that someone took the seat between us. No biggie, when we get on the flight, we'll just offer the window or aisle seat to whoever booked the middle seat. When it was our turn to board and we got to our seats, there was an older man sitting in our window seat. I thought that was kind of a dick move, to just take someone else's seat without asking. Obviously, this guy had flown a lot before, since he had pre-boarding status without having young kids, he wasn't disabled, and he definitely wasn't in the military. I let it go since we were going to switch seats anyways. Soon after the flight took off, the attendant came up to me with a gift bag and congratulated me for achieving 1K status. The gift bag wasn't for me, it was for the guy that took the window seat without asking. He obviously knew what was going on and has probably done this before. The guy was looking out the window all through boarding and never turned his head to acknowledge us until the flight attendant came over with a gift bag. I accepted the gift bag and the flight attendant asked if I'd like a complimentary drink as well. Of course I said yes, and I even got a free glass of wine for my wife too. I glanced at the guy, and I could see the anger in his eyes. But he didn't say a thing. It was a petty win for me over this guy that took my seat that I would have just given to him for free, but instead he took it without asking. Our next Reddit post is from Sieber. A number of years ago, I worked for a recruiting company that serviced a major automotive plant in the US. It was the first of its kind built in the US and it had just recently opened. Now, typically for my company, a business manager or owner or administrator would give us hiring orders for new employees. Usually, it's someone in charge who decides to hire new people. With this company, the administration handed the hiring decision to the new hire trainers, then those trainers would give us the order. I loved these trainers. They were deeply religious, family-oriented guys. Both of them adopted children from rough homes while I knew them. Both were extremely kind and welcoming to my new hires that I was sending in. They would go on missions with their church to help in struggling areas. While I'm not religious at all myself, I loved how passionate these guys were and how it reflected in working alongside them. The plant lowered production, and our orders for new hires slowed. My manager started writing me, Hey, go ask Bill and Ted if there are any new hires they need. Take them to dinner and see if you can talk them into hiring more employees. 
I explained repeatedly to my boss that Bill and Ted do not make hiring decisions. Those decisions come from way higher up in the company, and they just relay it. My boss told me that I'm new to this business, and I don't understand how networking works. Finally, my boss's boss starts writing on me as well during a meeting. They wanted me to push these guys to make new orders. So, I checked my limits for how much I could spend on schmoozing clients. And then I took these guys all around town for months. A new steakhouse opened and you guys want to try? Bring your wives and let's go. Do you want to hit the billiards clubs for lunch? The whole ticket's on me. Does the office want breakfast burritos and coffee delivered? Send your orders in and I'll bring it on my way. At some point, I figured there would be some kind of backlash over the money that I was spending. I even found out the max that I was allowed to tip and I was maxing it out every time to give out more money to the waitresses. The funny thing is, the plant increased production again, and I think my managers believed those new orders came from the money that I was spending, and not just the typical ebbs and flows of auto manufacturing. Eventually I left the company and those guys moved on to other jobs, but we had a blast on the company dime while it lasted. Our next Reddit post is from Karadash. For context, I'm a new supervisor in property maintenance, and the riding lawnmower we have is often broken down. A lot of these problems are from years of not doing preventative maintenance on it, which is something I've started doing recently to make sure the machine works better for longer and to cut down on maintenance and mechanic costs. I've been spending almost all my free time researching this lawnmower so I can figure out what's wrong with it, and so I'll be able to tell the difference between a 30 minute $40 repair that I can do or a 3 day $600 repair that the mechanic needs to do. A few weeks ago, while I was in the middle of starting a maintenance log on the mower, my boss sees me and asks, is that thing broken down again? To which I reply, no, I'm just trying to make sure that it doesn't break down again. This is when he lets me know that he thinks what I'm doing is a waste of time and money because our biggest expense is labor. So he no longer wants me to work on the mower and instead wants me to take it to the mechanic across the city that charges $110 an hour for labor. The next week, of course, the mower breaks down again. I tell my boss that I think the problem is likely the air filter, and he just tells me to take it to the mechanic. Me and my whole crew spend 45 minutes driving across the city to the mechanic, drop off the mower, and sure enough, they just had to replace the air filter and it took them an entire day. They also told me they checked the whole thing over and they found no other issues, and they charged us a few hundred dollars. Two days after getting the mower back from the mechanic, it started having issues again. I knew it wasn't the air filter, but the fuel filter looked extremely dirty. Once again, I told my boss, and once again he told me, take it to the mechanic. So, back we go. I tell the mechanic that the fuel filter looks bad, and I describe the issues I'm having. They say it's probably the fuel pump module, so they replace that, and they don't touch the fuel filters. This is another three hours of labor they charge us, plus parts, and the problem still isn't fixed. We get the mower back from them, and once again, it breaks down on someone's front lawn. I call the mechanic. He acts confused. Then he asks us to bring it back for them to work on it some more. This time, they keep it for three days. I told them something was wrong with the fuel filter, and they insisted that it must be the fuel pump. They took the whole fuel system apart just for them to agree with me that the problem was the fuel filter. Essentially, because my boss insisted that whenever there was a problem with the riding mower, we had to take it to the mechanic even if I could fix it. It cost us nearly a full week of lost work, plus over $1,000 in mechanic costs, when I could have had it back up and running within two hours for under 100 bucks. OP, I'm having a hard time figuring out who is more incompetent in this story, your manager or your mechanic. Our next Reddit post is from Expert Textpert Choking. This was back when I worked as a manager at a grocery store. I worked customer service, but when it would get busy, I would run a register until it slowed down. One night I had to take a few customers, and this one big guy comes in who was just in a really bad mood, huffing and puffing. He looked like he came straight out of Duck Dynasty. Beard, camo, hat, etc. We finish a transaction, and I'm starting to head back to the customer service when the guy looks at his root beer that he just bought and says, Diet? I didn't want diet. You know what? Forget it. I don't want any of this garbage anymore. Just take it all back. So now I'm struggling to figure out why this is, one, my fault, and two, why can't he just switch out the diet for the regular soda? 
His order was huge. And normally in these situations, I would just put it through as a refund for whatever amount was on the receipt. But since this guy was being a real dick, I decided to scan and return each item individually. Now he's getting more mad, cursing and saying to hurry up. I just responded, sorry sir, but it has to go through our system. Then he screams, just give me the effing money, so security shows up. I just laughed and said that is not how it works. We finish everything and he takes his money and leaves. About a week later I'm running the register again and he jumps on my line. When he saw that I was the one on the register, he tried to get out of my line, but all the other registers had huge lines. It's finally his turn and he says, Hey man, I'm really sorry about the other day. I was having a bad day and I shouldn't have taken it out on you. I was a little surprised, I'm not gonna lie, and I told him, Hey man, it happens, no worries. And now we're cool, he's always super nice to me when he comes in, and we haven't had a problem since. I just wish every Karen and Ken acted like him in the end. I'm kinda with you, OP. If everyone were nice to everyone else, then the world would be a much better place. But on the flip side, I think that I'd be out of a job. That was r slash malicious compliance, and if you like this content, check out my Patreon where I publish extra episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.